Hello and welcome. You're watching NDTV 24/7. I'm Rishika Barua on coronavirus facts versus myths. We know that the Delta strain is 2x more transmissible. This is something that's been spoken of, written off, but now the latest research has linked this very interestingly with a higher threshold for herd immunity. Experts now say that even a 70% immunity in the population is not enough to contain the spread of the delta variant a recent study in the lancet says and i quote here from the study with the elevated transmissibility of circulating variants vaccination coverage as high as 90% in adults might be necessary to fully relax control measures towards the end of 2021 so a 90% immunity in the population is needed to prevent the spread of the delta variant this is why Experts now say that cases are going up in some places even with high vaccination rates. Now the the rider here is that cases are going up but as you will see and as we'll put out in those graphics explaining to you the severity of the cases isn't that high in areas where people have received at least one shot of the coronavirus vaccine. So how does this revelation regarding elevated levels of immunity in the population and this is of course a you know what experts are saying in context of the spike in cases in the United States but how does this change the strategy for us here in India how should we be looking at this we are uh, joined by Dr uh, Lancelot Pinto he's an epidemiologist we're also being joined by Dr Sudarshan Balal the chairman of Manipal Hospitals thank you all very much for being with us Dr Pinto to you first how should we look at this latest study which essentially says that you need at least 90% immunity in your population to have herd immunity against covid hi rishika thank you for having me on the program uh i think there are other diseases like influenza for example where we don't talk about things like herd immunity we accept the fact that transmission will occur uh what we are really concerned about is the percentage of people who get hospitalized the percentage of people who die unfortunately uh from the disease and i and i pretty much envision that the same thing will happen with covid-19 as well we will eventually or we hope to eventually get to a point hmm. where we don't obsess over the number of cases as you rightly pointed out in countries with a high vaccination coverage despite having a high number of cases the mortality and the hospitalization seem to be very low so in that sense i think this obsession with herd immunity where we lower the rate of infection down to zero hmm. we need to shift that parameter to moving to a point where we accept that infections will happen there will be outbreaks in small clusters that will keep happening but as long as we keep our vaccination coverage rates really high hopefully it will not overburden the healthcare system hopefully people will not be sick enough to be hospitalized or die from the disease uh, so i think i think that should be our focus as we move forward well absolutely and increasing uh, you know the vaccine coverage has to be the top priority this is what experts like yourselves have reiterated time and time again but dr sudarshan you know it was widely believed that 70% immunity is good enough we were told uh, you know breakthrough infections is a new phenomena variants you know as we go along in the pandemic we're learning more and more about it you know one fears at the moment uh that soon we will need to relook at even our vaccination strategy in order to keep pace with the variants because what we're essentially learning now is that with the emerging variants we're moving further away from herd immunity uh good afternoon rishika thank you for having uh, me here i think you have uh, pointed out very rightly that we have to change our policy and uh, what is important is not just look at the number of infections a uh, number of infections is important but that's not the most important part the important part is the bridge between infections to hospitalization and in the hospitalization from the ward to the icu and then finally the mortality hmm. so if we can break the chain of severe illness hospitalizations icu stay and mortality we would have gained a huge amount and irrespective of which variant it is now what we have seen is people who have been fully vaccinated have had a much lower morbidity and mortality even though the infections have not disappeared so we should not look at eradicating the infection what we need to do is protect people from getting hospitalized getting very sick or dying and that can certainly be achieved if we achieve uh, mass vaccination in a short period of time and if you look at it uh, singapore is already looking at not looking at infections hmm 
vaccinating everyone and then trying to reduce the hospitalization in the ICU stay. And that should be our goal rather than a specific figure for X amount of uh, people getting infected uh, versus not. Because uh, there will be mutations and there will be changes that yes. we see in the future too. Yes. And in fact, in that, uh, uh, in that graph that we're putting out on our screens uh, right now, that's data from the UK, which essentially goes to show that with an increasing number of cases, you can see there in the red, those were the number of deaths. But if you look at the third wave, or the onset of the third wave where a large part of the UK's population over 40% has been double vaccinated. The cases are still high, uh, but the proportion of uh, people dying due to COVID is dramatically low. So that's encouraging data as well. But Dr. Pinto, in context of India, what should we learn from these revelations? One initially thought 70% immunity in population is good enough with the Delta variant. Now the study says it needs to be at least 90%. Our current zero survey, the results of which were out yesterday, says that only 67% of our population has immunity. What does this data tell you about the fight against the pandemic in India as it stands today? I think the data tells us that unfortunately we still can't lower our guard. Unfortunately, you know, sur surveillance will have to be key. Uh, looking at case detection rates, for example, or the total positivity rates are extremely important. So total positivity rates very often predate the uh, the overburdening of the healthcare system. So the moment in certain pockets you see the total positivity rate going up, we need to hire up, uh, we need mm. to up our guard at that point of time. We need to make sure that containment measures are in place. Mm. And the same time tested strategy of test, trace, and treat. You know, we need to we need to amplify that as much as possible. Right. That Dr. being said, even in terms of treatments, we mm. have newer options which have improved results as well. So even if do, people do get sick, you know, fortunately we have newer options which are available. Newer options of treatment, and that's actually the question I wanted to ask you also, uh, Dr. Sudarshan. We're looking at immunity, we're looking at vaccination, uh, you know, to respond to the Delta variant, but do we need to also be looking at newer ways to treat this rapidly transmissible variant, or will, uh, you know, the sort of tried and tested methods work? Uh, certainly, I think our primary focus should be on prevention of the disease. And uh, if we cannot prevent the disease, at least lower the mortality and the morbidity of the illness, yes. which means that there will be some options to improve the treatment. We have tried uh, various different treatments and unfortunately many of them have not uh, stood the test of time. Uh, like it started off with hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin, yes. plasma treatment, uh, uh, tocilizumab, so on and so forth. However, there is a standard of care, which is supportive care, oxygen, steroids in certain instances to be used used mm. very judiciously, monoclonal antibodies, so on and so forth. So there, is, there are continuous improvements in treatment that's happening. Mm. But the focus really should be on prevention. And there are three things we need to do. One is COVID appropriate behavior cannot be forgotten. We cannot lower our guard. Uh, our guard. Second is uh, vaccination, yes. aggressive vaccination in, on a mass scale yes. in a shorter period of time. Yes. Third is very, very, very diligent surveillance not only okay. testing for the virus, but also uh, testing for the genomic analysis to see if there's a new variant right. that's going to hit us hard, like the Delta variant. Okay, I think those are very important points that you both make. Thank you so much for joining us in the first part of the show today. I want to, however, shift our focus uh, to th the same study that's also talked about a very interesting phenomena, which is that in the event of a COVID-19 epidemic rebound during this winter, if cases are to rise again and one is to talk of future waves, the Lancet has now said in a latest study that living with children aged 11 to 17 years will increase the risk of COVID infection by 18 to 30 percent. The study says that children could contribute to the disease spread since they will be the population that will remain unvaccinated. This could lead to larger proportion of infections, clusters emerging in schools. The study also interestingly makes the point about the highly how detrimental this is going to be for education, for well-being for the mental health of children. And to talk more about this, we have Dr. Amit Gupta joining us from London. He's a pediatrician at the John Ratcliffe Hospital in Oxford. Thanks so much for being with us. Dr. Gupta, this is a very important study that essentially, uh, and if I may read between the lines, says that children could potentially be super spreaders in future waves because they are going to be the percentage of our population that's going to remain largely unvaccinated. You're absolutely right. Thank you for having me here. <clears throat> I think um, as the vaccination rates have picked up, you can see that in the UK as well, 70% of the population in the UK have got two doses now. So it's quite high. 
and the numbers are rising but the the group of uh, people who are not vaccinated and in fact the uk has decided not to mass vaccinate children hmm. because hmm. the ethical argument uh, because they have got very mild disease and we've been saying that so for a child getting a vaccine um, is probably the, the the risk balance is not right uh, the, the disease is mild and uh, the risks of vaccination uh, may be there so hmm. in that case the the dilemma that every government will face is how to deal with schools right now there is a risk if you open schools fully the children will the children will become reservoirs they will spread the infection there is no there, there's no rocket science in it it will happen but it then depends upon what is the impact in the adult population yes so in the population if you've got a uh, vaccine if you've got vaccine coverage which is very large then opening the children schools would actually be better because you are have you have less of a population at risk hmm. in india i think the different the, the situation is slightly different because the adult population is not fully vaccinated hmm. and my worry is that if you open schools willy-nilly just fully hmm. they will hmm. then become these clusters so you know it's it's but a difficult know, one uh, Do- uh, dr gupta the reason this study is particularly interesting is because for the first time we're actually looking at vaccinating children in the larger good so far it's been looked at okay you know children don't get very severe infection so they don't need to be a priority group of course a lot of trials still need to be done uh, you know for uh, vaccines on children we've looked at this from the context of reopening of schools like you said but this study very clearly says that adults will be at a 18 to 30% higher risk if they're living with children has it really been looked at from that prism the importance of vaccinating children i think i think it has been looked at and you know the the dilemma is still the same you've got concern for society that is adult population getting infected versus the risk and the the argument for vaccinating a child now that risk is 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 a difficult one and every society has to balance it hmm. so let me give an example you speak to a parent and say why should i vaccinate my child because there is a small and a rare incidence of myocarditis that is seen in in children yes. who are vaccinated with pfizer so then you say should i take that small risk given that let's say where i'm living here hmm. you got most of the adults vaccinated is it worth vaccinating the child and that's because the, the, you're not vaccinating the child for its child's own sake you're yes. probably vaccinating for society so that is an argument that's going to be very difficult there is no doubt that if you are an adult unvaccinated at home and your child is at school the child is likely to bring the virus home so i'm not surprised at all that the risk for adults will increase there's no doubt about it well no one could- safe no one safe until everyone safe uh but yeah. like you said there are there are several factors that need to be considered uh, and several ethical questions that you've raised also very interesting thanks so much uh, dr gupta for joining us just, it's just, it's a story where yes yes please go ahead one thing that i would like to add is you see we must not forget the impact on mental health of children yes in locked in for a year uh, it's not it's it's you know it's affected their education the rate of self harm in the uk has risen Mm-hmm. in adolescence you know the the so there is a huge amount of um, mental health consequence of of having been locked in balance that against vaccination and opening yes. up school yes i mean yeah. it is i don't think you will find a neat and clean answer vaccinating adults is a very clean answer right go and get it well, with children yeah. it's not going to be it's not going to be that neat and clean Right. Well, no, no, no neat and clean answers. I think we leave it at that. Thanks very much again for joining us. Thank you. Well, on to the other big story that we're tracking for you on the show today. Now, Canada has extended the travel ban to India till the 21st of August. You can't take a direct flight into Canada till the 21st of August. But here's the increasing problem, along with the fact that the European Medi- Medicine Agency, remember, hasn't yet authorized even. Uh, India manufactured AstraZeneca now Covaxin and Sputnik do not feature on Canada's list of approved vaccines Canada has approved four vaccines Pfizer Moderna AstraZeneca and the Johnson and Johnson these are the four vaccines on the approved list 
and Canada has of course started admitting tourists from the United States after 16 months but India two big vaccines here in India which is Sputnik and Covaxin are not on the approved list how should we be looking at this development Dr. Isaac Pogoch infectious disease physician and a scientist based out of the University of Toronto answered some of these important questions for us thanks very much doctor for joining us Canada is going to uh, start admitting vaccinated U.S. tourists, in fact, has already begun admitting vaccinated U.S. tourists despite the rise in cases and the onset of a global third wave. What explains this? The policy in Canada will be to admit uh, initially Americans and then more broadly else, uh, those elsewhere in the world, uh, but really admit those who have evidence of being fully vaccinated. Uh, of course, we know vaccinated people can still get the infection. We know fully vaccinated people who are infected can still transmit the infection. It's just much less likely. Currently, rates of COVID-19 are very, very low in Canada, but we are in various stages of reopening across the country. And to no one's surprise, we'll probably see a rise in cases as well. Having said that, I think this is a cautious first step to reopening the borders and allowing fully vaccinated individuals uh, seems reasonable as a first step, but of course, you have to be able to pivot if things are not going well. Now, the Bharat Biotech manufactured Covaxin, the Russian manufactured Sputnik are not in Canada's approved list. Do we, do we have any understanding as to why? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, as we read the policy now, those individuals would not would not be included. But again, I think we're in a, it's a bit of the wild west actually, where countries' policies are coming out and evolving with time. And I don't think what's true today will be true, you know, either months or, or, or even longer in the future. This is a period of significant change and evolution of policy. So currently that's what the policy is, right? You, people who are fully vaccinated with one of four different vaccines will be allowed into the country. Uh, of course, that might change with time. And I suspect, but I, I can't guarantee this, but I suspect that many countries around the world will have uh, some type of proof of vaccination to get into the country and that they'll probably look at the WHO list of vaccines and say, listen, if you've got something on this list of WHO approved vaccines, it's gonna be okay. But currently that's not the case with Canada and of course with many other countries around the world. Well, is it time perhaps for all countries to just access the WHO approved list in order to streamline uh, travel across the world? That's a question that remains to be answered. Thanks so much, Dr. Isaac, for joining us uh, with your thoughts. We're going to slip into a very short break, but coming up on the other side, we will answer all your questions on the COVID-19 vaccine. Dr. Yatin Mehta will be live with us. Stay tuned. Welcome back to our special campaign, Vaccinate India, in partnership with Google. We're discussing questions you may have about the coronavirus vaccine. Dr. Yatin Mehta, the chairman of uh, Medanta Institute of Critical Care with us. Thanks, Dr. Mehta, for joining us. One of the most important questions, how long does it take to develop immunity after getting the COVID-19 vaccine? Thank you, Rishika. Uh, that depends which vaccine you are taking, but normally it would take about four to six weeks to develop uh, significant immunity and that is why the gap between some vaccines has been kept at uh, 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 8 to 12 weeks now for Covishield and uh, for Covaxin it remains one month uh, you should start getting within a couple of weeks you should start getting your antibodies but actual efficacy of 70 to 80 percent would come after a month month and a half I would think right and uh, is there any way to gauge uh, the level of immunity that you attained after getting the COVID vaccine? <laughs> That's a very appropriate question. A lot of people are uh, overreacting to it. They get their antibodies measured and then they freak out when the antibody levels are low. I would advise just forget about it. There are two types of immunity. One is a humoral immunity, which is antibodies mediated. And one is a cellular Im immunity. And most of the vaccines they stimulate both the uh, immunities. Hmm. So don't worry too much about your uh, antibody levels. It is not recommended to check the antibody levels. Right. And, uh, you know, there are two types of antibodies uh, that are formed in your body. 
uh, one type of antibody indicates infection does another type indicate vaccination how really does this work no see what we get the antibodies is against the spike protein of the that is what most of the vaccines are doing it hmm. a spike protein is the one which attaches to the respiratory cells or any other cells in the body and it the virus enters through damaging those is it attaches to certain receptors certain places in the cell where it attaches with the spike protein and this is the antibodies which are produced against this so it changes the shape of the spike protein so the virus is not able to effectively enter the cells so those are the spike protein antibodies which you are looking at otherwise you look at immun uh, uh, neutralizing antibodies which neutralize all the aspects of the of the virus right uh, the other interesting uh, question is co of course there's a whole host of questions really about do's and don'ts after covid-19 vaccine uh, and a lot has been talked about uh, the consumption of alcohol should you avoid alcohol after covid-19 vaccination see i think it was advisable to not take it for a couple of days because uh, alcohol and also can have some degree of blood thinning effect now excessive alcohol is bad for health that i think people should realize that and don't drink too much but yes i think there is a this is a misconception that you can't have a drink for uh, months after that no you can right and and what about before vaccination are there certain do's and don'ts before you get the vaccine no not really i would advise people that uh, there is no need for fasting it is better because some people can have a vasovagal attack you faint a little bit of pain on the when the injection is being given on the site of the injection so have a light breakfast before you go for your vaccine if you are on blood thinners it is advisable i, I would think that stop it for a day before that that is basically so that you don't get a uh, uh, hematoma or a swelling uh, at the site of injection otherwise there are no specific uh, contraindications or those specific precautions to be taken what about smoking no there is really no relationship between smoking but i would still maintain that smoking is injurious to health so give us smoking if you right smoking. what are what are some of the uh, you know the the good practices to follow after you've been given an intramuscular vaccine in this case the covid vaccine and we know that the vaccine does have mild to moderate side effects in people what are some of the things you should and shouldn't do in the first 24 hours she take it easy the day you take a vaccine i think don't do any strenuous activity hmm I would advise people just take the day off and rest uh, at home you can walk around you will get a bit of pain at the site of injection you will get some body ache maybe for a couple of days some people get it more some people will get mild fever hmm. uh, these are normal side effects of the vaccine and nothing to panic about just take a, a, a paracetamol or crocin um, uh, to uh, make it a bit easier uh, otherwise there is nothing really more to be done if it persists after 2 3 days then you can consult your doctor right so typically these symptoms last how long about some i didn't get anything after my second injection uh, but otherwise uh, it can last for some people it will last for 2 3 days yeah. and is it true that if you've been infected with covid the chances of you getting the side effects from the vaccine are higher no that is not true in fact the people who have been vaccinated have have got covid and have got a second shot of the vaccine are likely to have many times better immunity than people have not had the disease all right well thanks so much uh, dr mehta for answering all of those questions thank you